it's it's my great honor to uh, to introduce our distinguished uh, guest, Professor Richard Sennett. Um, I could spend a long time giving you an introduction, but I'll I'll keep uh, the introduction short, and I'll try not to gush. Um, uh, Professor Sennett uh, has been widely influential on the sociology of cities for. Uh, quite a long time through his work at the London School of Economics, New York University, Columbia University, and MIT. He's published uh, prolifically. Um, of recent note is his uh, book, um, Building and Dwelling, which looks backwards, uh, which we'll talk about um, a little bit today. Uh, which formed the third part of a, a trilogy of, of books, beginning with The Craftsman and then uh, Together. Um, he, he has a, a, an, an armful of, of notable awards, in, including uh, the Hegel Prize, the Spinoza Prize, um, an honorary doctorate from Cambridge University, and an OBE. So uh, welcome, Professor Sennett, and, and thank you so much for taking some time to, to talk to us. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, and, uh, I'm sorry I can, um, you know, since I retired, I, I went to work for the United Nations and all the, that happens in the United Nations is people meet. So I'm in the middle of another Zoom meeting, but I, I'm really glad to talk to you for a while about, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, about cities. Thank you. We're, we're, we're very happy to have even a little piece of you today. Um, so I just I just finished building and dwelling and and uh, I I won't claim to have read all of your books but it's not the first of your books that I've shame, read. Shame, shame. And I know I'm <laughs> I'm working on it. I'm catching ah. up. Um, I think the, the 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 book is is fascinating and also quite timely in the in the time of of COVID. And what I'd like to do is to just ask you a uh, a couple of general questions about about the book. And then uh, some slightly more specific questions about its potential relevance to the pandemic. Um, so beginning, first of all, with uh, the, the overall theme of the book, the building and, and, the, and the dwelling part is a distinction that you draw between what you call the ville and the, the cité. Um, I wonder if, I know it's essentially this is the whole book, but I wonder if, if there's a way for you to boil down uh, the importance of that distinction and the relationship between ville and, and cité as you describe it in the book. Well, well uh, this a, it's a distinction between the physical environment and the way people inhabit the physical environment. A ville is the, um, traditionally, it, it, um, uh, it referred to ways of building and the uh, cité referred to ways of living. Uh, what I try to do in this book is counter uh, a cliche uh, which simplifies uh, this relationship by saying that um, we should build cities according to the way people live. And that's become a kind of cliche of a certain kind of urbanism which I think misses the fact that a lot of the ways in which people live are quite destructive. Uh, you don't want to build a gated community, although that's the most you know, popular form of housing in the world today. And I just feel, particularly in my generation of urbanists, that um, somehow we, we lost as planners the nerve to say, this is what's right and this is what we're going to do. And we became kind of servants of, of the cité. And it's, I mean, there's a side of this in which, of course, uh, rather than imposing a way of life on people, the way say housing projects uh, do that, um, we don't want to do that. But the other side of that is that as, a, as, as urbanists, as planners, we want to define what cities should be like and argue for people to live in those kinds of cities. So that's what this distinction is. I'm trying to get away. This is a more complex relationship than building what people want. 
Great, thank you. Um, I think for, for a great deal of your career, including this book, but for long before this, you've been an advocate of complexity and yeah. openness in, in cities. And one of, one of the quotes that I pulled from uh, Building and Dwelling is that you said that urbanism's problem has been a self-destructive emphasis on order and control. And um, I think you've argued that, that those things working together, complexity and uh, an openness can be responsible for generating what you call friction or resistance. Um, I, I wonder if you can unpack that a little bit, explain to us what you mean by Can't by you friction. ask me simpler questions? <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> Can't you ask me simple questions? <laughs> like, do you believe X or Y? Uh, well, I'll try briefly. I didn't know it when I began writing about um, the sociology of cities that I was an open systems theorist. Uh, I didn't know that until I wound up at the end of my career at MIT. And what I found by working with people there was that open systems theories are about the way in which we generate complexity, difference, friction, noise, and that these are all, these complications are all valuable in building up um, an electronic environment. And it just seemed to me there was an analog between building up that kind of complex open system electronic environment and building, um, and, and building a city, building a physical environment. I mean, cities, uh, they have agglomeration effects, you know, by concentrating uh, uh, differences where people compete and, and uh, cooperate in the same measure, bring together lots of uh, people who are uh, economically, racially different, and they physically should bring them together. The whole notion about an open city, as I see it, is it's about a place which doesn't have a pre-existing order, uh, a, uh, uh, a, um, a ruling order that uh, assigns where people should live, what they should do, and so on. And that they have to, people have to struggle with each other, which is a very messy process, often full of failure, uh, in order to find a better way to live together. So that's, uh, as I say, I only discovered I was an open systems theorist, you know, just about when I was ready to retire. But, but that's what this idea of the open city is about. It's okay. about the fact that complexity is a kind of stimulation uh, which uh, enables a creation. And, uh, in terms of where I ended up at MIT, it made me a critic of a certain kind of smart city, which is a top-down imposition of what people should be doing almost minute by minute in order to save energy to make the city a kind of homeostatic, homeostatic system. And uh, I think looking to the future that we have to be smart in a different way. We have to be smart the way open systems theorists are rather than the kind of models we have which are simplifying systems. So that's, that's what that's about. Great, um, that, that leads me to, um, I guess a pandemic related question about, about technology. I was going to ask you about that um, because that, the, the chapter in Building and Dwelling where you address uh, technology, and as you've just described, yeah. the, uh, the simplistic version of, of the smart city, which tends to close cities. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering whether you see, because I, I'm sure that we're, we're on the brink, in fact, it's already beginning to happen, that we're talking about um, the uses of technology to help us manage life in the pandemic. Can you, um, so I think there's this risk that we'll be tempted into sort of closed, um, simplistic city technologies. Can you suggest any 
positive uses of technology that might relate to the pandemic crisis? Well, um, it is a really good, good question. Uh, the work that, that uh, I and my team are doing uh, right now at the UN is focused on cities which are, are very resource poor vis-a-vis -vis the pandemic. Uh, cities in Latin America um, uh, and uh, in, um, in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa which don't have huge hospital systems and so on. And what we're finding is that some kind of uses of uh, short-scale short uh, networks done over, over telephones and whatnot are ways for people who don't have access to the kinds of resources we have here to cope with each other. For instance, if you set up a if you set up a, a, a short term, uh, I mean a short link um, uh, uh, a chat network, that if say Mrs. Suarez is fallen sick, that her neighbors know that and they'll, they'll leave uh, food outside her door or you know, speak to her through the door two or three times a day. It's, it's not high tech, but it's, it's a social use of tech, which for us is really important. And it, particularly so because this first flush, particularly in Latin America, has pretty much exhausted the, the you know, the resources, the neoliberal state, the welfare state uh, safety net is very thin and very torn. And it's, it's pretty much those resources have been used up by now. So what people have left is an attempt to deal with pandemic conditions, particularly in cities, you know, by inventing these, uh, these short stem um, uh, social networks on, online. And so I, I think that, you know, tech, that kind of tech really plays an important role. Uh, can I say something about this pandemic as I think it, what worries me about it in terms of planning? Please do. Um, I'm worried, uh, just as you say, that the long-term effects uh, of generalizing long-term from the crisis we're in now are going to mean uh, that we uh, close down cities by doing forms of uh, social distancing and forms of isolation, uh, which are um, uh, generating, uh, we're generalizing from the, the, the crisis condition we're in now to something that, that where we build more isolated cities. And that's a, that, would, that would be a terrible thing if we do that. And I, what my team is trying to do is figure out ways of reconfiguring density and patterns of density and use of public transport and streets and things like uh, street pedestrian traffic so that there's a way to keep the city more open and more uh, elastic. Uh, you know, it would be a terrible thing if we have a, if we do have a vaccine within a year to have built cities that were long-term really isolated because we generalized from this pandemic condition after the pandemic had passed. So I think that's a big challenge for urbanists, uh, which is how to think about a, a ways of dealing with density, which is a part of this problem. Uh, in in uh, in ways that that don't defeat its its virtues and its good uses out of fear that we have to to permanently isolate from each other, and it's got another side for us because um, density is a key to squaring the circle between climate change and health. Uh, that is long term 
for climate change. We have to make cities denser. We've got to reduce the scale of them, but density is a key to efficient use of resources. And it, we need to experiment with how to combine that kind of goal, I think, with a kind of more elastic way of dealing with density during the pandemic. That's, that's very interesting. I think, I think you're absolutely right that we're, we're all so focused at the moment on the public health impact of the virus itself that we're not really confronting the, the wider public health impact, the mental public health impact of, of everything that we're and social. doing to us and social. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't want to uh, take up too much of your time. I don't, do you have time for one last question? Sure. Sure. Absolutely. Okay. A very sort uh, of general Every answer. UN meeting is endless. So, okay. Um, so the, 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 the point of, of all of us getting together today is that, is that we were assigned the task of coming up with a set of themes that might relate to um, uh, key, key features of, of a post or peri-COVID uh, city. And, you, and to, to some extent, you've already addressed that in your answers to my questions. But uh, do you have any signposts to offer us? What would your themes look like? Well, uh, density obviously would be uh, a very big one. Uh, I think one of the the issues in in this is that the the way in which we're dealing with um, um, with the pandemic at the moment is increasing social and economic inequality. That is, if, you're a, if you pick up the garbage or you're a nurse, you don't have any choice about being in the presence of people who are, who are dangerously ill. But if you're a middle-class person, you can work supposedly from home. You can practice social distancing. And one of the things that really worries me about the way particularly the press thinks about this is that they, they feature the notion of uh, work, uh, isolated work, as a kind of solution to a problem. It's only a solution for middle-class people. And it's one that I think is gonna really uh, uh, widen the already huge gaps in cities, of uh, uh, social and economic equality. Working class people, don't have any refuge in in uh, in distance work. So uh, I think one of the signposts for me about this, other than density, is how we don't leave a legacy which has increased uh, uh, inequality in the cities. And um, I think physically that means getting people uh, not to normalize for middle class people the notion that they're safe because they're isolated from other human beings. That's a very, very worrying to me. Thank you. I think that's, in, that's incredibly important. Um, thank you for this. Okay, thank you. Um, I go back to my other meeting, which will go forever. But I hope something comes out of this. And will you keep me informed about what you do? Sure, yeah. Yes, okay. please. Yeah, please do. Okay. Good. Best to you all. Okay. Bye. 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 Grazie. Grazie, Richard. Ah, grazie.